manage this. I thought, uh oh. Next. No food, just the water. Get out from the line, the signs, okay? And, oh. A few things, and for people who are listening on the website, on the webcasting, I'd really like to have your, uh, send me a notice you are participating in this so we could plan the meeting better, especially the traffic, the broadband. And also, um, I need your, your suggestions, your comments about the current series. We also need to think about if our budget allows us to do another series, what should we focus on for next year? And send me your ideas, your comments. Should we do it or what should we do? Okay. Um, also, after Dr. Fenton's talk, um, we'll have time for discussion. And uh, we're also going to have lunch at uh, McCormick and Schmix, 11 year. Everybody is welcome to join us for lunch discussion. And uh, what else? Um, please mark your calendar for our next one next month. But we will be back to the EP building. And so it will be on May the 22nd. And I wanted to, again, I want to thank everybody who have been very helpful and very, very important in organizing this, get everything going, and for all of you to participate in our series. That's all what I want to say. Please welcome Dr. Denton. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ling Hong. Welcome to you in the Sacramento audience, as well as those who are listening, listening listening to the series over the web. This is our third lecture. We're halfway through. We have six lectures which have been scheduled through, through this uh, coming spring and summer. And as you recall, our opening lecture by Dr. Ho on February 20th introduced us to the fundamentals of epigenetics. And our second, second seminar on um, February 27th by Dr. Jerry Heindel focused on developmental origins of health and disease. And if you missed those two lectures, you can watch video archives on uh, OEHA's website. The third one today is by Dr. Sue Fenton, and she's going to be explaining and telling us about her work illuminating how environmental chemicals impact the development and function of the mammary gland. Dr. Fenton received her BS, her MS, and her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And her PhD and postdoctoral studies focused on cellular and molecular biology of development and differentiation of the mammary gland during pregnancy and early lactation. Dr. Fenton has been a research biologist at US EPA's Reproductive Toxicology Division since October 1998. And her current research involves identification of the effects of environmental components on early development, pubertal timing, and lactational function of the mammary gland. Her research findings have received many awards, including receiving twice the highest EPA Scientific and Technical Achievement Award. And in her presentation today, she will focus on how perinatal exposure to environmental chemicals disrupts mammary gland development, especially in relationship to pubertal timing. So with that, please welcome Dr. Fenton. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ling Hong and Dr. Denton for this invitation. Um, it's nice to have so many people interested in the, the work that you do. Uh, I hope that you'll find um, some new and interesting things today. Um, when Jerry Handel was here uh, last month, he talked a, a whole bunch about uh, developmental basis of disease, and I'm going to continue from where he left off a little bit. So he talked about um, four categories of um, 
disease-based um, entities that I'm going to uh, recap again and then go on from here. So he talked about reproductive and endocrine effects, party, uh, cardiopulmonary effects, immune and autoimmune effects, and then brain and nervous system. Today I'm going to stay within the en reproductive and endocrine and talk a little bit about um, the breast effects and a little bit about some of our prostate um, data as it relates to um, the work that we've done with the breast, breast um, models. Um, we are using animal models for our research and um, one of the reasons that we do that is because at the EPA it's very more, it's much more difficult for us to do the human studies as we are not located um, near a clinic. So today I'm going to talk about our animal studies that have a strong focus on mammary gland developmental effects and how those developmental effects may be linked to lactational impact or breast cancer risk and how puberty is involved in all of that. So in 2007, the American Cancer Society estimated that there were about 700,000 women that would be diagnosed with cancer. Of that, 26% of those would have breast cancer. And um, nearly a third of the men would have prostate cancer. So these are clearly very highly relevant um, topics to study. We have um, seen a general increase and then a leveling off of the level of breast cancer over many years. Um, the only other um, cancer that is still on its way up is lung cancer in women. Of the about 12 percent of all women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, um, about a quarter of those women, or possibly up to a third, have familial cancers. And we're not going to talk a lot about that today because that is something that's inherited. There's either a mutation in a single hypenetrance gene or there are mutations in multiple low penetrance genes that make up this about a quarter of all breast cancers. We're going to talk more about how these women with the other 75 or nearly or a little over two-thirds of the cancers have sporadic cancer. These cancers do not have clustering in, in the families and they have a um, possibly a strong component of environmental um, and lifestyle um, modifications that affect their risk for cancer. One of the environmental components could be endocrine disrupting compounds or EDCs as I'll call them. These are agents um, as defined by the EPA. These are exogenous agents so not something that your body produces normally. This would be an exposure outside what your body's already producing that interfere with the synthesis, secretion, transport, binding, action, or elimination of natural hormones in the body that are, um, are needed for your normal cell maintenance, reproduction, development, or behavior. So some people may think that EDCs have to change like an estrogen receptor. It isn't that it has to change a receptor or a binding of a receptor. It can change how that compound is eliminated or how it responds to other compounds um, within the tissue. So back to this um, list again of developmental basis of disease. Within this um, reproductive and endocrine uh, list, I'm going to talk a little bit about cancer. I'm going to talk about puberty, and I'm going to talk about lactation because all of these are somewhat linked and um, have long-term adverse consequences. So obviously, um, my interest in the developing organism stems from the fact that um, I have three wonderful kids at home and I want to do everything I can to do to um, make their world as healthy as, as possible. Um, development is a highly integrated process. So you have rapid growth taking place during some periods and then extensive differentiation taking place during other periods. And they, and they may shift and come back to rapid growth. And the mammary gland is specifically a good example of that because there are times when it grows slowly, um, like right after birth, and there are times when it grows really rapidly during, like during puberty. There are also times when it undergoes differentiation and then programs cell death and back to a normal growth pattern. So this gland is uh, particularly of interest because of the different stages of development that it goes through. 
There, during these rapid stages of development, there are many opportunities for um, rapid uh, for um, lesions to occur. And one of the, because I don't know how to go back, I'm just going to talk about the last slide. Um, there are many opportunities for lesions to occur and, and for cancer to be initiated during those rapid growth periods. So two things that are very important um, about that period of development are that you can have fetal programming. So you can have a change in the how that um, tissue is going to turn out for its entire life during this um, very early critical period of development. And you can also um, um, <laughs> there are several adverse outcomes that can come from uh, exposure during these critical periods. And so we're going to talk about those today. So one of the first things I want to talk about is um, puberty and how it relates to breast development. There are, is very little data uh, available on increased um, breast cancer risk and how it's related to environmental estrogens or EDCs. And some of that is, be, um, is, being, um, t is being studied at a, high, at a much higher level now because the NIEHS has um, specifically set up multi-center multi breast cancer grants that are focusing on pubertal timing and how that may influence breast cancer risk over time. Um, one of the reasons that they've done this is because um, Shalemu and coworkers had studied um, three decades of um, girls and their pubertal timing. And they found that there was quite a change from like the 1960s, 1970s to the 1990s, where in the 1970, they saw about 2.5% uh, precocious puberty in all, all the girls studied in this very large study. And, but by the 1990s, 10% of all girls had precocious puberty, which meant that they were having breast development as early as age 7 or 8. And in the PROS and NHANES 3 study, they have, um, Dr. Herman Giddens has data that shows that about 11 to 12 percent of Caucasian girls and up to 30 or 40 percent of African American girls that were eight years old had Tanner stage 2 or higher breast development. So Tanner stage 2 is the stage where they say, yes, you're starting to undergo puberty. And so um, if any of you have ever had an eight year old child, that is a very early age for them to start breast development. And in 2003, the EPA had an expert panel workshop where I was um, affili affiliated with that workshop. And we went through the data from all of the studies that have been published on pubertal timing in girls and, and boys. And we decided that there was a significant um, precocious puberty event uh, epidemic, in fact, going on in girls. Um, but the, their timing of menarche, their first period, had not changed. It's still about 12 years old. So what's happening is that breast development is starting early and it's taking a long time to take place. They're still finishing about the same time, but they're starting early. So there's a much larger window of um, sensitivity or susceptibility to other agents that may cause disease for those girls. Um, so my goal is to identify environmental exposures that alter rodent mammary gland development following prenatal or lactational exposures to high use or to persistent environmental contaminants that are known or suspected to be EDCs. And um, to that end, I'm not the only one doing this. So there are several compounds that have been identified that um, alter mammary gland morphology. Um, the ones that are in yellow are the ones that we've studied quite a bit. But um, atrazine is a high-use herbicide known to delay mammary gland development and um, also has long-term consequences that include mammary gland tumors, effects on lactation, and transgenerational effects that we'll go over today. Bisphenol A, Dr. Heindel talked about last month. Um, Dr. Anna Soto and several of her colleagues have um, performed several studies leading to conclusions in rats and mice that this um, can cause long-term developmental consequences. Cadmium, the metal cadmium, dialdrin, um, dioxin or TCDD, which we'll talk about a little today, all have um, impact 
on lactation as well as others. Diethylstilbestrol is one of the best examples of a compound that, that alters mammary gland morphology and as is genistein. Nonophenol is a uh, uh, has unknown consequences, but we do we have seen progress, uh, precocious development of the mammary gland with that compound. There are others listed here. Um, perfluorooctanoic acid is one of the newer compounds that I've worked on in my lab, and we've um, actually seen um, both lactational and morphological effects of that compound. In in addition, a high fat diet is also known to affect um, mammary gland morphology and tumor susceptibility. And as you can imagine, the high-fat diet in conjunction with any of those others that were listed there um, may um, have combined effect. So before I um, embark on some of the science and data that I'm going to um, show you today, I want to go through like mammary gland development 101 because I know a lot of people don't know a whole lot about the, the terminology and the, how these um, structures are scored. And this is very important for the use and risk assessment so that you have a good basic understanding of the gland, how it's regulated, and the terminology that we use so that you can interpret the results if the author hasn't interpreted them well for you, which does happen, I'm sure. <laughs> so in the, when the animal is born, this is called a whole mount, where the entire gland is removed from the skin of the animal, inside of the skin, and laid flat on a slide, and um, various labs do it um, the preparation of it then differently, but what we what you can see is a three-dimensional structure of the epithelium shown here and As it's growing out into this large fat pad So after it's stained you can see the epithelium and when the animal is born They have this very small area of epithelium and this would be where the nipple region was on the skin attached to the skin this large thing here is a lymph node and it's very important in um, late life as it's one of the sites for metastases if there's a cancer. As the animal grows, so does the epithelium of the mammary gland and so does the fat pad. So it gets larger over time and the epithelium um, begins to fill this. And during puberty, this is really rapid growth. And these terminal end buds, which are on the end here, are um, quickly dividing structures that will split and branch out and fill, try to fill the whole gland. When the animal is an adult, you will see that the epithelium has filled this um, fat pad and it has contact inhibition. So as soon as it reaches the edge, it stops growing and then it ma is maintained in that state um, throughout its life if it doesn't become pregnant. If it becomes pregnant, the hormones of pregnancy begin to cause it to fill the gland even more to produce lobulo-alveolar structures that are the basis for milk production. They'll have a myoepithelial lining on the outside that will squeeze them, the grape-like structures, and cause the milk to go into the ducts, drain into the collecting duct, and be excreted through the nipple. So when we score mammary gland development, um, there are several details of the growth of this gland that are important. One is longitudinal growth. We, you can't see the nipple area here, but it's located right down here. We measure we may measure the distance from here out to the furthest point that it's grown longitudinally or laterally, usually longitudinally though. We also look at how many primary ducts there are because some compounds actually, uh, because we're treating these structures in utero, they have not developed yet and therefore we may impact the number of primary ducts that are developed in the gland which will affect the size of it for the lifetime of the animal. We also look at um, lateral branching, which is what's going to fill the gland eventually, so or the lack thereof, because right here you can see a, an area here where there really is no lateral branching, and we we don't like to see that. Um, but here you can see these are well branched structures. We also look at budding. There's these very small, little, darkly stained uh, blips coming off these long ducts. The, that budding is very important because that's actually going to be a branch eventually, and that's a sign of how well the, the structure is proliferating. We also look at terminal end buds because they are the structures that are susceptible to carcinogen because they're so highly mitotic. And they are the splitting ends that are rapidly elongating to fill the gland. So with that said, 
Um, when we score mammary gland development, um, we use, my lab uses a system that is very similar to what pathologists use around the world. So we look at the normal glands, we look at the controls first, we see what they look like. They don't always look the same in every study. They can be slightly different um, depending on the strain of the animal or the species of the animal. And then we look, look at the most abnormal glands. So in our case, like the highest dose treatment. We want to know what the best glands look like and the worst glands look like. And then we compare everything else based on that. So we'll develop a scoring system. It's one to four with the best glands receiving the highest, the most normal glands receiving the highest score, the most abnormal glands receiving the lowest score. And what we do is we look at every slide then um, without knowing which dose it came from or which treatment it came from. And we put them in stacks of slides. So we've, we'll stack our slides up um, like this. So all of the fours would go here, um, threes here, twos, and ones. And sometimes based on your criteria, which are um, standard, they may not fit into those, so they fall somewhere in between. We then pick these slides up when we're done. We look at every slide within that stack. We make sure they all look alike, set them back down, go through each stack that way, same as a pathologist would. Sometimes our morphology distribution looks like this, the top one here, where especially in the case if you're using a higher dose treatment at multiple doses, you may see that you have really um, severely affected the mammary gland development, and you may have more abnormal than you have normal. Um, but if, but in some many cases, and especially what I'm going to show you today, we have much more of a normal distribution, where we have a few glands that are at this high level, a few that are at the low, and everything else falls in between. Dioxin is one example that I want to talk about today. It's probably the best example to start off with because we know so much more about the effects in humans than we do some of the other compounds I'll talk about. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with dioxins. They're structurally related class of chemicals, include dibenzofurans, biphenyls, naphthalenes. They're chlorinated, brominated, or they're mixed, bromine, chlorine, um, and ends. They uh, mediate their effects by binding to the aerial hydrocarbon receptor and um, then the signaling that they do from there is fairly well known. They uh, affect CYP1B1, CYP1A1 through the use of uh, ART. They're persistent and bioaccumulative, and they're, they have a common spectrum of responses. And the compound that we used in our studies was TCDD, the most well-characterized one. So what we found in our earliest studies was by giving um, one microgram uh, per kilogram body weight, TCDD, to the animals on gestation day 15, which is about six days before the offspring are born, we can disrupt uh, mammary gland development. And these are sections of mammary gland that are stained with H&E, hem hematoxylin and eosin. And what we're looking at are these dark structures here. This is a, this, these are the ducts of the gland. And you can see by comparing the TCDD to the control that there are far fewer ducts present in the TCDD treated than there are in the control. And that's true both uh, at four days after birth and 37 days after birth. 37 days after birth, these animals will have already gone through puberty. So they already will be um, approaching sexual maturity. And you can see this is a terminal end bud. These are those teardrop straight shaped shaped structures that I was talking about before that are susceptible to carcinogen and highly mitotic. We see um, an increased number of, T of TEBs in the dioxin-treated animals at a time when the control animals are already starting to form these lobuloalveolar structures where there are clusters of lobules that will eventually be the basis for lactation if they became pregnant. What we also found was that there was a critical period identified for these effects. So we got lucky, I guess, when we tried um, gestation day 15 for our first exposures because we went back and exposed animals to one microgram per kilogram body weight of TCDD again. And we did that in, on day 15, 20, postnatal day 1. So 20 is one day before birth. Postnatal day 1, postnatal day 3, 5, and 10. 
to see if there was some time, or, or if all of these times were critical in the development of the mammary gland. And what we found is that only gestation day 15 had a very strong and persistent impact on mammary gland development. So here you can see is postnatal day four. We've looked at the female <coughs> offspring that had this in utero exposure on postnatal day four and see the very strong inhibition of growth that's taken place, especially the branching morphogenesis that's taken place. And we also can look at the distance from this lymph node. Um, and here you can see quite a bit of distance. But that, it, that wasn't the case for gestation day 20 or postnatal day 1 or any of the other times that I mentioned. We also looked at weaning the day that we take the pups away from the mother. And we found that we still had this um, big impact on only longitudinal growth and branching morphogenesis. So postnatal day or gestation day 15 is a critical period for development of the mammary gland because that is when the bud, the epithelial bud, is just starting to form in the fat pad. So what we've impacted is that epithelial development that has just begun in the fetus. There are other changes um, that are fairly consistent with dioxin exposure, early life dioxin exposure. Um, Earl Gray published results um, that it delays vaginal opening, which is the, the physical um, sign of puberty in rats and mice. It's when the vaginal opening um, actually isn't opening anymore and it's not sealed shut. There were two other reports also, both mine and um, from Corolla Martinier's group, showing that um, dioxin at this same dose at one microgram per kilogram does delay puberty, the signs of puberty in the rat. And there were other effects from this exposure, but one of the things that is interesting about this is that there's no correlate to vaginal opening in girls, and dioxin didn't seem to appear to affect men's, like the cyclicity, the estrous cyclicity of the animals which is an endpoint that is, could be similar in, in girls and women. Um, we, we looked at dioxin doses that were lower than one because we didn't see, you know, we saw very dramatic effects in the response in the mammary gland. So we went down, we looked at 0 0.05, 0 0.2, and 0 0.8 micrograms per kilogram body weight. Again, at a single delivery on gestation day 15. And what we found, we looked at the animals on then gestation day 21, the day before they, the day that they would be born, essentially. And we looked at, um, f at least in a subset of animals, we looked at gene expression in the mammary tissue on gestation day 21. And then in another subset of those same animals, um, we allowed the, the dams to go ahead and have their pups. And we looked at puberty and mammary gland de development um, in post um, post-puberty in those animals. First, let me address the physical signs of puberty on, in those offspring. We, at 0.8 micrograms per kilogram, we saw significant changes in puberty still, significant delays, um, without changes in body weight. So this is very important, too, that we assess body weight in all of these studies, because if there's a developmental change um, in the animal that's causing them to be smaller, that all of their tissues will also be smaller. So we want to make sure that the effects we see on the mammary gland are not because the animals are smaller to begin with. And in this case, they are not. But what we did find is that we had significant mammary gland delays in the F1 females at 0.2 micrograms per kilogram. So we, these, were, these changes were um, a greater than 100-fold increase in CYP1B1 gene expression, greater than 10-fold increase in CYP1A1, uh, greater than two-fold increase in aerial hydrocarbon receptor expression, and more than a three-fold increase in ART gene expression in the mammary tissue on gestation day 21. So um, the maximal gene expression for, um, for AHR and ART was at 0.2 micrograms per kilogram. So we saw much larger changes for the SIP genes at 0.8 micrograms per kilogram and they were upwards of 5,000-fold gene changes. So this is a very robust response at, at quite low doses. 
um, which, which, but they still don't approach the level that humans are exposed to dioxins. We also saw transgenerational effects with dioxin. And this was the, one of the first compounds um, reported in which we did see transgenerational effects um, besides DES. The F1 offspring, or the first generation offspring, had persistent changes in their mammary glands that we could identify up to 110 days old. So we called these permanent. I mean, these animals are beyond sexual maturity, and um, there were no changes um, due to estrus, the, the normal changes that take place in estrous cyclicity um, for these animals. So these were permanent effects. The F1 animals were bred to males and allowed to have their own litters. And we saw altered maternal behavior in the F1 dams. We saw a change in the gender of the pups. And we also saw an increased mortality in the second generation pups. So what's happening is we have an increased uh, mortality from two and a half in controls to 15% in the treated, in the animals whose mothers were exposed in utero. We also saw a decrease in milk ingestion in a, what we call a lactational challenge, where we allow the pups to, to nurse from the mothers for only a certain amount of time, exactly. <laughs> They're very difficult studies to do, but we do see a decreased weight gain in the pups from dioxin-treated animals. And we also saw that the mammary glands of the second generation offspring were delayed also, and this wasn't related to weight. So what is the significance of delayed vaginal opening? We don't know because, like I said, there's no correlate in girls. So although this is a basis for some of the testing guidelines, we do not uh, have any indication of what this actually translates to, if this is an adverse effect or not. However, in the case of the mammary gland, we do. So in the animals that I just talked about and in other studies, we've, we know that um, one microgram per kilogram of, of dioxin or two and a half micrograms per kilogram of dioxin gestationally exposed will increase carcinogen-induced tumor formation in the mammary gland. And we also know in humans that a doubling of serum dioxin concentrations in girls more than double the odds of stunted breast development, which is what we show in animals. And we also um, know that Chemical plant workers exposed to TCDD contaminants have a twofold increase in breast cancer in the female workers. Now, those numbers are small because there aren't very many female occupationally exposed women. Um, and also, we know that measurable TCDD in the blood, milk, or drinking water had, was correlated to um, an increase in odds ratio of 2.1, which was significant in this case for breast cancer. So there is information on this for dioxin because of the accidental exposures, and which is not the case for some of the other compounds I'll talk about. But the other adverse outcome of, of dioxin exposure is shown here. This is lactating mammary gland that's, uh, again, a whole amount, so you can see the three-dimensional structures. And this work I did in collaboration with Beth Vorderstrass and Paige L Lawrence um, at Washington State University. And what we saw was that in animals that were exposed to dioxin during pregnancy, we looked at the, now the, the lactating gland. So this is a little different than what I previously showed you. And we tracked through pregnancy as the gland is developing into a fully functional lactating gland. We, saw, we could see the differences in di from dioxin exposure as early as day nine after a, a day one exposure. So... Um, Early on, you can see that these lobule alveolar um, clusters are not forming. You can see it more dramatically on day 12, and it's very dramatic now on day 17, which is only a few days before the, they're going to give birth. At parturition, you can see that this is a fully functional gland with um, heavy um, epithelial staining because they're, it's you know, grown at a substantial rate to produce all the milk that it's going to need to maintain the litter, whereas this one has not. Um, we often refer to this as like summer foliage and spring foliage on a tree because it's like it's not, it hasn't reached full development yet. However, if we exposed um, virgin animals, adult 
virgin animals with dioxin, and we've done this repeatedly in multiple studies that we've run, there is no effect of dioxin on the mammary gland. So in the adult, non-developing gland, there does not appear to be an effect. So this is definitely a critical period um, issue. Now, dioxin, like I said, dioxin is not the only um, compound that we've identified that can do this. We've also looked at the high-use herbicide atrazine. Here at high doses, um, you can see that the as early as postnatal day four, following gestational exposures, pre prenatal exposures, we can see that there's a developmental impact on the mammary gland epithelium, much smaller, much less branching. At postnatal day 33, which is about the time of puberty, we can see that the two gland shoot, sorry, we can see that the two um, glands in atrazine treated and dioxin treated have not grown together. We can see two glands at a time in the whole mounts. So um, this is a nice way for us to assess how much they've grown longitudinally and laterally. And then in the adult, the sexually mature adult, we can see uh, quite a difference between the control and the atrazine or dioxin treated animals. Atrazine, like I said, is a high use herbicide and it has, it's a documented endocrine disruptor. So it disrupts things like uh, puberty, pregnancy maintenance, mammary gland development, prostate development, and lactation. The potential mode of action um, is via CNS control of hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, but we don't, we don't know that that's the mode of action for all of the effects that are listed above. And in fact, um, I've tried at great lengths to prove that it's um, a CNS um, HPGA axis effect for mammary gland, and we can't prove that. So. It increases mammary tumor development in Sprague Dolly rats with, um, that have had chronic adult food exposure, um, but the mode of action there was from in, um, hastened reproductive senescence, which doesn't happen in women the same way it happens in rats. So even though atrazine's been shown to increase mammary tumors, the mode of action for that effect isn't relevant to humans. But this compound has a short half-life in the adult rat, and it has reported health effects uh, from chlor chlorotriazine metabolites. So um, when we first started these studies, we started looking at um, a cross-foster paradigm where one group of animals was treated with control, one group was treated with 100 milligrams per kilogram of atrazine, which is high dose. These litters were cross-fostered at birth, and we, looked, we wanted to look at like the, what was more important, the in utero exposure or lactational exposure, or were they both important for the outcomes in the pups? So we generated four groups. Control, control, which the first one is the one that they were born from. The second letter is going to be the one that they nursed from. So we had control, 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 atrazine, atrazine, control, atrazine, atrazine. What we found, and this again is a whole amount, and you'll, you're looking at the epithelium here, 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 and here. These are a little light, so hopefully you can see them. But um, you can already, by postnatal day four, we can see dramatic changes from all of these exposures. These exposures, um, especially um, the later exposure from nursing, seem to have a persistent response, where after puberty, we still saw delays in mammary gland development. Um, there was a significant change in timing of vaginal opening that corresponded with these effects at the high dose. Um, we delayed puberty by um, two days with lactational exposure only and up to four days with both in utero and lactational exposure. Along with this, um, we looked at changes in several genes to see if we could find what was driving this response and the only two genes of interest. So we looked at a lot of growth factors, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptors, like insulin growth factor, things like that, that we know cause proliferation and branching in the mammary gland. The only things that we found that were kind of related to this response was a down regulation of aromatase gene expression, both in the, uh, it wasn't significant yet in the lactationally exposed, but it was in the atrazine-atrazine group. 
And we also saw down regulation of epidermal growth factor receptor, which is pivotal for the six and seven or seven ligands to um, signal through and that are all known to be expressed and um, developmentally regulated in the mammary gland. So we saw significant down regulations of the EGF receptor. So this may point us in the direction of a mode of action for these effects. Um, but interestingly, in this same study, we looked at the males to, to confirm or refute some of the previous work by Stoker and Cooper, Ralph Cooper, showing that um, early postnatal exposure to atrazine caused increased prostate inflammation in the males. So since we had the male offspring anyhow, we looked at um, the development of the prostate in those animals because of the similarities of the prostate, the developing prostate to the mammary gland. So the prostate also develops late in the fetus, just like the mammary gland does. And the budding of the epithelium happens just prior to birth, like the mammary gland. It, there's an important role of androgens, which is um, the androgens regulate the mammary gland in the opposite direction as they do the prostate. So they inhibit to the, the mammary gland um, connection to the nipple area in the male, but then they drive prostate development in the, in the male. Um, the branching morphogenesis occurs primarily after birth, which uh, these are two of the few tissues in the body that do that, and there's differentiation of the epithelium that's fairly dramatic. In the males in this study, we also saw um, what Stoker had previously reported is that there was an increase in lateral prostate weight at 100, 120 days after birth. So you can see here um, a fairly dramatic increases in weight uh, at postnatal day 120 for the atrazine atrazine group and um, significant changes in the groups that nursed from an atrazine exposed dam or that were in the atrazine atrazine group. And this is, kind of, this is just an example of what we saw in the lateral prostate. We saw focal areas that were inflamed. So this isn't something that happens throughout the entire gland make, and making it much more difficult to assess. These are uh, um, neutrophils and lymphocytes that have infiltrated the interstitial area of the prostate. And um, this is not really the most severe case, but we did see um, micro abscesses that would form in these tissues. Um, more recently, what we've done is we've looked at an atrazine metabolite mixture at much lower doses than what we had originally looked at. And these, this mixture is composed of atrazine, which is 25% of the in, you know, percentage by weight of this mixture. Hydroxyatrazine, which is a hydroxylated form of atrazine, um, typically thought to only be produced in plants, but it is found in groundwater, in surface water. That made up 20% of the mixture. Diethylatrazine and diisopropylatrazine are the first level breakdown products of atrazine. So 15% of this mixture was DEA, 5% was DIA, but these Breakdown products can also be formed from other chlorotriazines, such as simazine or propazine would be on this side and it would form DEA. So propazine, simazine, and atrazine can all go to form these three metabolites and DACT being the final metabolite, I'm DACT here, being 35% of the mixture. So very quickly this is broken down into the, this DACT. Um, but the, where we got these numbers from were from reports, the USGS reports and extension reports from different states that measured all of these compounds in their water, their surface water and um, rivers and such. So what we did is we exposed rats to these compounds for the same amount of time that we'd previously exposed um, for, with atrazine, five days during pregnancy, the last five days during pregnancy. <coughs> And we assessed the, the tissues then at multiple times after birth, whether it was a female, we have assessed those earlier, and males were assessed later. But what we did is we exposed them to 2.5 parts per million 
25 parts per million or 250 parts per million, which this level was 100 times the level that was reported in the um, papers that we used to develop this mixture, the maximum contaminant limit. They were 100 times the MCL. <clears throat> so um, in the female offspring, we, again, at these very low doses <clears throat> of the mixture, saw effects on mammary gland development. At the lowest levels, <clears throat> these effects weren't as persistent as what we'd seen with the atrazine alone. Um, but at the higher level of this mixture, which was more than tenfold lower than atrazine, and actually this 8.73 milligrams per kilogram, or the 250 parts per million mixture, only contained 1.8 milligrams of atrazine. So nearly tenfold, uh, um, excuse me, a hundredfold less than what we originally used. And we saw very similar results in the morphology of the gland. At postnatal day 33, right after puberty, we s still see these delays in development that are present out until adulthood. <clears throat> in the male offspring, this is a paper that was just submitted to, to TOXI, um, we also see changes from these mixtures. These levels <clears throat> are lower than the current NOEL for the effects in, uh, with atrazine alone. And one of the things that we saw was in the lateral prostate on postnatal day 120, we saw a dose-dependent increase in the incidence of inflammation from these uh, mixtures, these low-dose low mixtures. And we also saw an increase in the number of microabscesses, which leads to a higher severity score in the end. Um, in the ventral prostate, too, we saw effects from these compounds, which we don't see with atrazine alone. I mean, uh, the previous reports from Stoker and, and several others um, have looked at the ventral prostate in the, with atrazine alone, and as did we, and we didn't see an effect with atrazine. But these, mix, the mixture does seem to affect the ventral prostate. Here's an example of what we see in the ventral prostate. We see, again, these focal areas of inflammation. Um, there, it's not spread throughout the entire gland, which um, makes this difficult because what we do when we assess the prostate is we use five sections from the prostate. Most labs only use one. So if they got lucky and they had inflammation in that one, then they say it's a positive. In our situation, we need to see it in two out of five to call it a positive. So we're being a little more conservative and we're assessing more slides. The pathologist assesses these for us. So um, in the atrazine, with the atrazine story, we do know that there's also a critical period of development there also. We have not delineated the critical period for the prostate, but we have for the mammary gland. So um, we, we treated them for from day 13 to 19, 15 to 19, um, uh, 13 to 15, 15 to 17, and 17 to 19. So various uh, seven, five, or three-day periods in late gestation or late pregnancy to look at what is really the critical stage that atrazine is affecting in, in the development of the mammary gland. And it appears that the very latest um, time is the most important. So if we expose from day 17 to 19 versus... Um, uh, the control, we see dramatic changes in mammary gland development that are similar to if we gave them a seven-day exposure. What's happening here, so I told you with dioxin, we were, um, it had targeted the period of bud development in the mammary gland. What's happening here is the period of rapid outgrowth of the epithelium is, seems to be the most important critical period for atrazine effects. Now, one of the ways that we can judge this, too, is by looking at the number of terminal end buds that are present in the sexually mature animal. And we see dramatic increases in terminal end buds in the animals treated with atrazine. Now, because we saw the, so, oh, I need to point this out also. In the mixture studies that we did, we didn't see changes in puberty. But we still saw changes in mammary gland development at these low levels. And also, when we're treating these animals for three days, we don't see any changes in um, pubertal vaginal opening. 
but when we treat for a longer period of time, we can delay that. So it appears that too is um, time and dose specific. But that the mammary gland does appear to be a little bit more sensitive than, puber than vaginal opening as an outcome. So because we saw the increased number of terminal end buds still in the sexually mature animals, we bred them to males. Siblings of what I just showed you were bred to males and allowed to raise their own litters. And again, we saw effects on the second generation pups in terms of their weight gain. So again, this is translating into lactational impairment in these atrazine treated F1 offspring. So they're not able to produce enough milk to maintain the weight of their offspring. So these second generation pups, these F2 pups, were evaluated on postnatal day 4 or and 11. And we saw based on which day they are exposed. So here's 13 to 15 is yellow, 15 to 17 is orange, 17 to 19 is teal, and 13 to 19, which was the 7-day exposure, was red. Both the 17 to 19 and the 7-day exposure caused a significant decrease in the weight of both girls and male and female offspring at PND4 and even more significant effects at postnatal day 11, which is actually the peak of lactation. That's why we chose this date. <clears throat> so from these studies, we know that um, mammary gland development is, uh, delays are evident in two generations following a three-day atrazine exposure, which we think is its sensitive window, the 17 to 19. There's no effect on vaginal opening due to this brief exposure. So clearly a mammary gland may be, may be the most sensitive tissue at this point. In the first generation, there was no effect of body weight on the mammary gland effect. I mean, we know this because we're really carefully comparing the mammary gland scores to the body weight of those same animals. But in the second generation, there was. So even though we saw mammary gland developmental delays in the second generation here, these animals were smaller, and that was the reason for that. But the malnourishment that we see in the second generation does stem from the underdeveloped mammary glands of the first generational dams. So our atrazine work has shown us so far that the females have persistent changes in mammary glands, depending on dose. The males have nodules, uh, visible nodules on their prostate and inflammation at the, morpho at the path histopathological level by 120 days of age. There are significant delays in vaginal opening with lactational exposures op only, but not in the males. So there is slightly different regulation in the males and females with um, the physical signs of puberty that we can assess. In the mixture study, the females had delayed mammary gland development at the lowest doses that we've tested. And, and um, the males have prostate inflammation in the ventral prostate, which is dissimilar from atrazine. Now, that's not necessarily at the lowest levels tested, though. So the prostate doesn't seem to be quite as um, sensitive as the mammary tissue is. And there, um, this critical period has been delineated for the mammary gland, but not the prostate. And we also don't know what happens late in life within the males. We don't know if this inflammation goes on to become hyperplastic or if um, there are tumor formations later in life. That, th those studies haven't been, haven't been done. We've also looked at the disposition of atrazine and this metabolite mixture in pregnant and lactating dams. And we do find atrazine staying in the mammary gland because we can detect it in milk, that we, we milk the rats. We can see atrazine, we can detect atrazine in milk six days after the exposure has stopped. Now the half-life of this compound is like 17 hours, maybe one day if you want to be generous. And so it should be uh, undetectable by six days later. But it is, it is present and we do see an accumulation in the mammary gland that's um, visible by um, a very abnormal distension of the ducts um, until you get past day four of lactation. And we don't know why, and that's something that we're aggressively pursuing. The last group of compounds that I want to talk about are perfluoroalkyl acids. Um, this is more recent work from my lab, but it's yet another example of a very diverse group of compounds that can delay mammary gland development. Um, these perfluoroalkyl acids are hydrocarbons with a 
with a, a different lengths of carbon backbones that are fully fluorinated. So they can, they can also have a functional group on the end, which can be sulfonic group or carboxylic group or phosphonic acid. The most common PFAS are the C8s, which is what I'm studying, and um, specifically I'm studying perfluoral uh, octanoic acid. It has an estimated half-life of about four years in humans and about two weeks in a mouse. These are man-made chemicals. They're very stable. They don't break down in the environment, um, and they are terminal metabolites. So that's why we're so interested in the C8s, because anything larger than a C8, like a C14 or a C9 or C10, produces a C8. Um, their surfactant properties lend themselves um, to a wide, wide uses. I mean, so they're used in Gore-Tex, Teflon, popcorn bags, um, food containers that you use for microwaving your food, anything that's grease or waterproof, um, scotch, you know, the scotch guarding that they put on your mattress, your sofa, your carpeting, all probably have these compounds in them to some extent. Um, so in two, um, in, by 2002, 3M had phased out PFOS, which is another compound that we've actually studied in our group. Um, John Rogers has studied quite a bit. Um, and they're poised to take PFOA off the market by 2015. And so at some point, it will probably be gone, but I don't know that they have good um, um, substitutes yet. So we're going to continue to identify the health effects of these compounds. The major routes of exposure in humans include drinking water, inhalation and dust, um, or oral intake. Now, um, although all the other data that I've shown you today was in the rat, this is going to be in the mouse because the rat, the female rat, excretes PFOA very rapidly, which is unlike the female human. And so the mouse and the human are much more similar in the way that they get rid of this compound. So we've chosen to use the mouse in our developmental studies um, of, with pregnant mice. Now, we don't use any dose over 10 milligrams per kilogram for these studies because this causes increased mortality of offspring. Uh, and you can see that here. Um, this is work by Chris Lau um, showing this um, 10 is this uh, darker teal color right here. You can see that the postnatal survival really drops off when we get to 10 milligrams per kilogram of this compound. So we have used uh, 5, which is this green color, or less in all of our studies. Um, we've exposed pregnant mice to this compound for all of gestation, half of gestation, or the last third of gestation, and compared the effects of this compound on the offspring. What we've found is if we look at the mammary gland um, in a whole mount of the pregnant animal, um, the day that she should be delivering her mice, so in the mouse they have a shorter gestation, so their end of their pregnancy is gestation day 18, not 21 like the rat. So um, they were exposed up to the day before. On the day that they were to deliver, um, we looked at the mam what should be lactating mammary gland now of these animals and find severe impairment of the lactational tissue. Um, so you have your summer bloom and your spring bloom, early spring bloom in this case. Um, and then when we look at the morphological sections, stained with H and E again, of these mammary glands, you can see why. So in this first panel here, the control at postnatal day 10, this is what a mammary gland should look like when it's fully functional. So this is the peak of lactation in a mouse. This gland is fully revved up to produce milk. All those dark staining structures are epithelium. They're all touching each other. They're um, all filled with milk. They look like they're very productive. Here you'll see large areas of adipocytes showing still. Here, here, all throughout here. These, these lobule or velar units that are producing the milk aren't touching each other. They're not at full capacity there's a strong delay in development here. When we look at postnatal day 20, the mice are ca already causing the mother to, mothers, um, to wean them. So they're, they're nursing less, so the mother's mammary gland is already starting to apoptose, a normal um, involution of the gland. 
Um, and here you can see this, it looks fairly abnormal now. So there's larger areas of stromal tissue showing. There's adipocytes showing again. Um, they're not in contact. The epithelium isn't in contact with each other anymore. But when you look at day 20 in the, in the PFOA treated animals, they're still fully lactating. These, these, their pups grow slower, and that's shown in the mammary gland here. So the pups are much smaller and still nursing on mom all the time at postnatal day 20. So we've got like a 10-day shift in where they should, the mom should be in lactation. So you, these effects are seen early. They, de they delay the lobulo-alveolar development. They delay weaning. So we weren't able to wean these animals at the normal time at five milligrams per kilogram because um, they were still nursing heavily. And it affected, significantly affected the weight of the pups. One, of the, one other reason that it may be affecting the weight of the pups is because we're shifting some of the milk protein genes, specifically lactoferrin. So shown here are the three time points that, of exposure. So we had the, sh the last third, half of the last half of, lac of pregnancy, and all of pregnancy. So we looked at the milk proteins beta casein, epidermal growth factor, alpha lactalbumin, and lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is interesting because it's supposed to be really high at the beginning of, of lactation and really high at the end of lactation. Kind of at the time, it's um, an, almost an antimicrobial protein. It's used to help the offspring fight off infection. And what we're seeing is in the animals that had the worst um, morphological effect from PFO exposure, they also had a completely opposite shift in the expression of this gene. So while it should be high, so this is postnatal day 10, while it should be high on postnatal day 1, it's high in the middle of lactation. And when it should be very high at the end of lactation, for all of the exposure periods, it was significantly lower than control levels. So um, w there's definitely the shift in, um, in protective capacity. There's a shift in possibly the amount of milk they're getting and the quality of the milk they're getting. And you can see here, hopefully you can see this, um, here is a control with her, all her normal looking animals running around with her um, at the end of a lactational period. And here you can see an animal, and these, this number is wrong, I'm sorry. Here you can see some of these pups with this uh, PFOA treated animal that don't have their coat that are severely developmentally delayed. And what we saw over time, and I know you can't probably see the details of this, but it, hopefully you can see the difference, that here's the control, and here are all the different periods of PFOA exposure that we gave them. All of the exposures that we gave significantly delayed the weight gain in the offspring. Now, when we looked at the offspring's mammary gland development, again, we saw dramatic changes in a mammary gland development, the most dramatic that we've seen with any compound that we've evaluated. So here's postnatal day 10, control. And again, this is mouse, so it looks a little different than what I've, what I've previously shown you in the rat. Here's the structure from um, the last third of pregnancy, the last half, all of pregnancy. Interestingly, the mammary glands from the PFOA exposed animals really don't develop over that 10 day period. They grow, the animals grow in a uh, exponential fashion, but the mammary glands did not. So this is a very strong, um, severe um, delay in development that we're seeing with, these, with, these, with this compound. Whereas here you can see there's been dramatic development and you're seeing already terminal end buds developing on the ends of these structures in the um, control offspring. We do, with PFOA, we have information on a polluted area of Ohio and West Virginia where we can compare human serum levels to the levels in the blood of the animals that we're testing to kind of look at whether or not we're um, looking at a health hazard for humans or not. So in our PFOA studies, in everything we do, we look at the blood levels in the offspring or the dams or, or whatever we're using for our experiment. <clears throat> You can see here that there are fairly high levels of this compound. So this is times 10 to the third nanograms per mil. So this is 20,000 
nanograms per mil um, high levels in the, in the blood on postnatal day 10 and 20. But you can see it dropping over time in the offspring, but not necessarily in the moms. And that's because uh, micturition takes place with rodents, where mom has to lick the uh, anogenital area of her offspring to make them urinate. Therefore, she intakes their exposure. Clearly doesn't happen in humans, thank the Lord. <laughs> and, um, and so we think that's why we're seeing sustained um, exposure in the dams, and whereas the offspring levels are coming down as they should be over time. But here you can see the levels in the controls, and this is much more similar to what we see in human population. So I'm trying to show you that there's a big difference in the ex levels in the animals here. But what we're doing is we're carrying these experiments out to, for longer lengths of time to see if these are permanent, if, um, if when the exposure levels in the blood go away, if we still have these impaired mammary gland development and what happens in multiple generations. So from our PFOA effects, we know that um, it affects both postnatal growth and development, um, partly because of the effects on lactation and partly because of the effects during pregnancy. We have done some cross-fostering studies with this compound and um, Barbara at with Barbara Abbott. And she's published that, showing that the in utero exposure has a really huge impact on the weight gain in the offspring. Um, and that if you add lactational exposure onto that, you can get an even more severe effect. Um, transgenerational effects are being examined now. And the body burns of PFO in this animal model should continue to be determined so that we can use this information to determine whether or not it's correlated with human levels of exposure. And, um, and then we really want to know what happens in old age. And we do have some data on that. We see hyperplastic alveolar nodules develop, or HANs, develop in mice. It does, they, rats don't get these. Rats get mammary tumors. Mice really don't, unless you're using a specific strain of, rat, of mice that are susceptible to tumors. Um, so these are things that you wouldn't find in a control, but what we're finding with the PFOA treatment is that we get more of them and they're larger and more severe. We haven't been able to um, quantitate the severity yet, but you can see here examples of how we're measuring this. Here we see no, no Hans. Here we can see one or two or three, somewhere between 10 and 14 on closer examination between 20 and 29, and we break this down into multiple groups. And then here you can see this is very severe where you see these areas all over the place and they're very dense, um, so more hyperplastic than um, previous example. And so when we chart this, we see a trend of increasing both the number, but what I can't show you here is the severity, like how large is each Hans compared to what we see in the other um, in the control groups. So we do see a trend for more of them as we go across the dose groups. And um, a lot of our studies right now are looking at what the long-term adverse consequences of this exposure are for the mammary gland. So what does all of this mean in conclusion? What I hope you'll take home today is that the mammary gland does seem to be a sensitive tissue to the effects of EDCs. <clears throat> I've shown you three examples today. I could show you seven more probably. There are now multiple examples of this. Not always delaying development, though. So EDCs can either delay, like I've shown you, or they can cause precocious development. Um, the dosing and timing of the exposure appear to be critical. There are critical periods early in life. They don't necessarily fall on top of each other for all these different compounds. Um, we haven't gotten down to a small enough time period for PFOA to tell you exactly which critical period it is for that compound, but we do know that it's late. The late exposure will cause the same effect as the entire gestation. Um, the effects on the mammary gland are not, do not appear to be dependent or correlated with timing of puberty in rodents, so puberty seems to be a, less, a little less sensitive end point. The EDCs affect branching, growth, and differentiation. And these can lead, all lead to different adverse consequences. So we've seen altered F1 and F2 pup growth, changes in milk protein gene expression, changes in maternal behavior. We've also seen altered development from permanent to um, transient. 
And so for those that are persistent into adulthood, that's where we're getting these F2 um, effects. So the prostate is also affected by EDCs. The mode of action and the reason for these effects aren't well understood. In fact, the mode of action for the mammary gland effects aren't very well understood. We've looked at hormone after hormone to see if there's any correlations. We've uh, clearly body weight is something we're always looking at. <clears throat> We've looked at multiple genes for their and their expression, and that's one of the other things we're doing with PFOA right now is we're looking at a profile of gene expression because that compound is a known PPR alpha agonist, and um, so we're evaluating that as a mode of act, a possible mode of action. And then, can this be translated to human health? Well, we think so. And then also, it's risk for breast cancer. In translating this work to human health, there are studies that were done back in the 50s and 60s that aren't being done anymore for um, ethical reasons, um, but that looked at the development of the mammary gland in fetuses of humans, human fetuses, depending on their embryonic week, and charted that development. We can compare that to what we see in the rodent. So the mammary epithelial bud forms are in the first trimester in women, in the fetus of women, whereas it forms in the last, tri the last port part of pregnancy in the rodent. So the big difference. Women in their first trimester may not even know they're pregnant, are exposed to so many things that, you know, they quickly will change as soon as they know they're pregnant. Um, and so this is really a critical period for women. Um, there are many developmental events that happen that are the same in women and rodents, the majority of them, in fact. Um, so branching and canalization of the epithelium happens in the second trimester in women and toward the end of... Um, pregnancy in the rodent. And then the terminal end buds, which are those critical structures that are so susceptible to carcinogen effects, they are present during puberty in both rodents and humans. So if girls are going through puberty at an earlier age, if they're starting breast development at 8 and 7, and they're still taking till 12 to develop the breast, instead of like over summer vacation, which happened when I was younger, you know, to several of my friends, you come back and you don't recognize them when they come back to school in the fall. Um, that is um, similar to the situation that we're showing with um, atrazine, dioxin, PFOA, where you're having these really long periods of terminal end buds being present in the gland. Instead of them going away shortly after puberty, they're um, sticking around until the animals are sexually mature. And that does happen in control animals. They, there are some here and there, but for the majority of the ends to be terminal end buds in the, these exposed animals is very abnormal. And, we'll, and <clears throat> at least in the example of dioxin, has been shown to increase their mammary tumor risk. <clears throat> so moving forward in this field, um, exposure during the neonatal period causes the most serious and persistent effects on mammary gland and prostate development for most of the EDCs tested. Not just the ones I've talked about today, but bisphenol A, genistein, um, and DES. The mammary gland development um, is significantly altered at times when other pubertal endpoints in rodents are not, such as body weight changes, vaginal opening, and changes in the first estrus or the estrus cycle. Correlation of the mammary tissue in assays assessing pubertal endpoints following any EDC exposure, early life EDC exposure, could facilitate determination of which EDCs are most important and which mechanisms may be affected. So right now, the mammary gland is not included in the tiered testing, any of the tiered testing. It's not included as a required tissue in the NTP testing, except when you're doing a two-year study. So any of the early life exposure paradigms that we have right now aren't including this tissue. So the people in the breast cancer field, the breast cancer advocates that call me and go, why can't we get this included? Why, why is EPA doing this? What are, you know, I can't answer all those questions. I clearly don't make those decisions. But the breast cancer advocates are very upset because that only slows the pace at which we can identify which EDCs are important in risk for breast cancer. Right now, it's a, a bit of a snail's pace, actually, to do individual studies and um, with smaller numbers, nothing like NTP would do in their large studies. 
and um, try and get answers to these questions. So in our further research, we need to determine if there are late life effects of these various EDC exposures. Like what are the adverse effects? Do um, multiple compounds share in the lactational impairment? Um, do they cause increased breast cancer or mammary tumor risk? Is there altered risk for mammary tumors? Would be nice to know in every study, but clearly very expensive studies to run. Not usually possible unless you're a very well-funded lab. Um, so using standard operating procedures in mammary developmental studies across all the labs that are doing this type of work would facilitate the, the progress that we make. It would help us to be able to um, use similar terminology all the time to be able to interpret the data the same way and to uh, help the risk assessment people um, be able to understand what it means that there are 20 less ducts in the gland. If there are calculated changes in the metabolism or clearance of endocrine disruptors when given to pregnant and um, lactating animals would also be a good thing to know um, to just for the children's, children's health risks so that we could evaluate those situations in, in human populations. And then what role can early gene expression profiles have in determining which compounds to test for further mammary effects? They may be the most sensitive uh, biomonitoring device that we have, but at this point we don't have a profile that we could hand to someone and say, here's what you really need to be looking for. So with that, I want to thank the people who have been involved in these studies. I have some great people that I've worked with, and I, a lot of this work wouldn't be possible without my collaborators at the CDC who measure the um, chlorotriazine metabolites for us and also measure the perfluorinated compounds for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Lots of data Sue is talking about today are new, and some of them mm -hmm. have not been published, <coughs> some of them just were submitted for publication. And this is really cutting edge information. Now we have about uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes for discussion, for questions and answers. Uh, for people who are participating by web webcasting, I'm sorry we posted the slides almost at the end of the talk, but you can download them now. And we have some technical difficulties. And now, for the people in this room, please identify yourself when you ask questions. And Dr. Jim Donald is going to read the questions through the emails. I already have two. Uh, coming okay. in. And why the first one is from your colleague at the federal EPA, I think in San Francisco. Okay. So how about we go over there first? Okay, this is a question from uh, Dr. Winona Victory. Were the pups nursed by di dioxin treated mothers? It might make sense to give pups to a surrogate mother. Also, what was the weight difference due to? Did the mother produce less milk? My first lab experience was milking rats back in the early 60s as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it is difficult. Uh, many questions. I'll, um, I'll try to go back to the beginning of those. So yes, the dioxin pups were nursed by their own mothers. We, uh, we chose to do that for, for a number of reasons. And one was because we knew the dioxin would be transferred in the milk. We really, we wanted to find out what a normal, what the normal situation would be, how, how persistent the effects in the offspring would be if the mother indeed did nurse them. So that's where we started. So for the data I showed today, yes, that, that is the case. We did see changes in, vol in weight gain of pups based on, we saw less weight gained in pups under a timed nursing situation when the animal was exposed to dioxin. So she was producing less milk in a timed nursing. We didn't measure it by vacuum aspiration like we do. In, we collect milk like that for other reasons. But because the milk from rodents sticks to the tubing so badly, we couldn't accurately measure the volume produced that we could, that we could aspirate out of, the, out of the mammary glands. So we chose to do it by weight gain in the pups instead. And there, yeah, there was a significant effect. And that 
but the pups weren't of lower weight at that point. So what we evaluated was how often they nurse, and what we found is that they nursed almost all the time. Whereas, um, that isn't, I mean, the control animals did not do that. They were taking, they were having periods of rest, long periods of rest, whereas the dioxin pups were nursing often. Hello, uh, I'm Derek Gallon from uh, DPR. Uh, I, have a, I have one question mm -hmm. concerning atrazine. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's been shown many times that atrazine reduces food intake and body weight in rats. Um, have you done any, uh, and some of the effects of atrazine can be mimicked by dietary restriction of undosed rats, particularly the prostate effects. Mm -hmm. Do, have you shown any, can you, can you mimic the mammary gland effects by similar dietary restriction? No. We can't. Um, in fact, in the animals, that that's one of the reasons. So this is a very good, important point that he brought up. Um, Susan Laws, Tammy Stoker, Ralph Cooper, that group has actually gone back and looked at um, some of the weight, uh, like prostate weight gain in a dietary restricted group. And they do see um, that it, the dietary restriction alone can't repeat that. but in our hands, we, we went back and did, specifically did a study based on um, looking at weight gain for all these different groups, and we know that they aren't taking in less food, but we think that it's possible that the chlorotriazine metabolites that are being transferred in the milk may cause the pups to drink less. We wonder if it isn't this transfer in the milk that's making them less hungry because we know that it can do that at higher levels and we know that we have fairly good transfer of that early in lactation. So that may be important. I mean, but we do know in our study that, that does, that's not the reason for the mammary gland effects. Really good question, thanks. Hi, I'm Brian Davis with the Department of Toxic Substances Control. If, if we accept the notion that the breast would be particularly susceptible to cancer because of the high uh, mitotic activity and proliferation, and your histology suggests that dioxin reduces that proliferation, then would it be plausible to anticipate that dioxin would actually be protective well, this is, a, this is an interesting question, and actually that's been tested, and the answer is no, it's not protective. What happens is that in the studies that have been done previously where they've given DMBA or MNU as a carcinogen to pr promote that tumor formation, in the studies that have done it well, they also have morphology data to go along with, with their cancer outcomes. Um, so like half of the animals were dosed with the carcinogen, half of them were sacrificed, and they looked at the morphology of the mammary gland on the same day to see what it is about the structures that are different that make one more susceptible than the other. And what has been shown is that if there are more terminal end buds present on the day when they get carcinogen, which is the case for dioxin, it makes those terminal end buds hang around longer and not differentiate. So they're there longer and there's more of them. Those, those animals do get, have a higher incidence of cancer, but they don't have more cancer per animal. So their multiplicity isn't increased, but their latency to tumor formation and their incidence is increased. So we have actually undertaken that same study with atrazine, but we don't have that study finished yet, to look at, because it delays the terminal end bud differentiation, does it actually promote an increase in incidence or multiplicity? So that's a very good question. Um, there, we're actually trying to secure some funding now to compare some of these different compounds so that we can answer that um, 
not just for one compound at a time, but for, you know, if we know we have three compounds that will delay that terminal end bud differentiation and keep them around for much longer periods of time, do they all translate to increased tumor risk or do only some of them? And then we can get back at what are the mechanism, what is the true mechanism for this? Is it strictly, strictly the timing or is it um, cell signaling, cell signaling that's disrupted that we haven't identified yet? And so that's a very important question to us right now is, you know, doing this one compound at a time is, is interesting and, and useful, but to compare them all I think would be even more useful to kind of sort out where are the differences and where are the similarities. We have a question from uh, Dr. Dave Maury in our Oakland office. Have you looked at the effects of EDCs on colostrum produ production? <laughs> uh, we are... We are particularly interested in how these compounds are transferred to the offspring right after birth versus slightly later in the milk. We, uh, to date, we have not been able to do a very good job of collecting colostrum because it's so sticky that we can't, technically, we can't get a useful quantity of it to use for our studies. So we haven't been able to assess that because of technical issues. But we have, we definitely are interested in that <laughs> because especially for the perfluoroactanoic acid, we think that there may be a high transfer right after birth that isn't reflected in some of the, the very limited amount of data that we have from humans and from rodents at like peak lactation where they think it's um, like one-tenth or one-one-hundredth of what's in the serum. But we have a feeling because of the chemical structure of that compound that it may be at higher levels in the colostrum. Can't prove it yet, though. Joan Denton, I have two questions for you. One is that keeping with the theme of this seminar series, epigenetics and genetics, can we, just, can we simply assume that these manifestations of development go back to a genetic or an epigenetic mechanism. And then the other question is the discrepancy of the results of the, of the uh, early differentiation in humans versus um, um, it's consistent in puberty with the animals but not with, with the variable results you're seeing in, in animals and what you might attribute, the, and again the observation of this whole population shift for humans mm -hmm. with mammary gland development. Mm -hmm. So those two questions. Yeah. Um, so the first question, one of the, even though I am very interested in the actual reasons for our multi-generational transfer of effect, uh, especially in the mammary gland development, my goal more is to identify the health hazards. And so we haven't done a very good job of looking specifically at whether or not we have changes in methylation because I, I, I think we clearly have fetal programming effects that we probably do have changes in methylation of specific genes that regulate mammary gland development. But because of my goal within the EPA, I'm trying to identify the health hazards and the doses and the timing more than I am specific mechanisms. But I think that clearly is um, of interest, and I hope someone in academics maybe would, would pick this up and roll with it if they can get funding, because I think that's very important to identify which genes are really driving this response, this permanent response. Um, your, the second part of your question, um, we don't have a very good idea yet of why we have this early development, and then it sort of um, goes into a holding pattern until menses. The BCERC, the Breast Cancer and Environmental Research, Research Centers that are funded by NAEHS, have a group of, of girls. They have, I think they have about 800 or 900 girls in San Francisco, Cincinnati, and Manhattan where they're looking at these girls starting at age six and they're measuring all these things in their urine and their blood to try and look for some of the, the 
EDCs that we've identified in animals to look at what's driving that early breast development because they too are seeing these girls go into that holding pattern um, within their study. I mean, it's throwing them for a loop. They didn't expect this, and but all of us that are doing animal work are completely not surprised because we see this in the animals. So I don't know. We can't answer that question yet. There's, there's a paper coming out from Mary Wolf very soon that does start to identify some of the, the EDCs in the blood and urine of these girls that has a correlation with their breast development. Um, and I think that's an environmental research that it's coming out in. So they are starting. But I think, you know, the breast cancer field, unfortunately, started off in the, looking for environmental factors that regulate it in the wrong time frame. You know, they were looking in women who already have breast cancer in their urine and their blood right now when they have cancer. And they should have been looking, you know, when they were teenagers. Where did you live when you were a teenager? Um, you know, comparing crop spraying or, or insecticide use or something like that to when, where they were when they were teenagers. Now, I think we're finally getting to the point where the studies that are beginning now and, and may be carried out for the next 40 years are looking at the right time point. You know, they've asked extensive questions of the parents and the um, doctors of these children and where they live. They've gotten dust samples from the homes. They're really doing an extensive evaluation of what kind of exposures these girls have and how it's regulating puberty, and hopefully they'll be able to continue. Hi, Purni Iyer from OEHA. Very fascinating talk. Uh, so, you know, keeping with this prolonged, extended, sensitive period, and it might be kind of premature, my question would be what, how would you translate that information into testing guidelines? Mm. You know, do we have enough information to say, okay, you take the multi gen, say, in your FIFRA study? and you've got the exposure period covered, mm -hmm. but what would you be looking for? Uh, it's not really premature if you ask me. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm fairly opinionated on that question. I have spoken to the people at um, Health Canada and NTP and even our own uh, people that are involved in setting up the new um, altered in utero lactational exposure guidelines and asked them to incorporate uh, PND4 as a time of analysis for the mammary gland because one, these whole mounts are really cheap. I mean, you don't need any money to do these. Two, in all of those testing guidelines, you have to um, cull the litters down to the same number of animals per litter. So all they have to do is use the discarded animals, the animals that they're going to get rid of anyhow, take those females from all the treatment groups, open them up, take the mammary gland out, put it on a slide, fix it, really super cheap. They, I mean, they wouldn't add $100 to the cost of their study. And they would have some idea of whether or not the mammary gland could be an interesting outcome in their study. At that point, whenever they do their kills, they could be looking at it, which where they don't right now. But PND4, as you saw, I mean, every single one of mine, you can see it as early as postnatal day four. And that is a really easy way for them to start to incorporate this. And it's like an early biomarker. You know, they'll, they'll know, yes or no, do I need to worry about this right off the bat. Okay. So. Uh, the other question I had is that given that, you know, when you spoke about the, uh, the fluorinated acids and, you know, how, and using mode of action to determine how effects are seen, you know, they almost seem to be balancing them out. And as a population, you're exposed to so many compounds. So mm -hmm. just your comments on that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is a really good question. And I think that's where we need to go. There, there's only one person that I know of who's really doing a good job of kind of turning this around, you know, using the data that others of us have generated and kind of flipping the, the tables and saying, okay, now I know what the mixture is that these people are exposed to, now let me look at the risk. And that's Andreas Kortenkamp from the UK. He, um, he's identified like a mixture of phenols and parabens that are significantly correlated with 
mammary gland developmental effects and risk. And so that is really difficult work to do. It's very expensive. <laughs> it's, very, it's very difficult. Um, I know like Warren Foster from um, McGill University has tried to do the same thing and he's not been able to find the mixture that matters. Um, with this mixture of chlorotrizing metabolites, we definitely have something there. But, you know, obviously you're exposed to several things in your water, not just that. So that is a really good question. I don't know, maybe in 10 years we'll have some major progress in that direction. But Because I think all of us know that we need, to have, we need to go that direction. But it's whether or not we have the money and the ability to do it. A, excuse me, a question from Dr. Rich Sedman in our Oakland office. Um, has mechanism been shown to be hormonally related or to have other causes? Hmm. To date, we have looked at every hormone assay, <laughs> we've read every hormone assay I can almost get my hands on to look for correlations between changes in hormo serum hormone profiles with the outcomes that we see. And we can't find any. In fact, we've kind of beat ourselves up a little bit because prolactin is hypothesized to be the mechanism for the prostate effects. Yet we can't identify that. We can't, we can't find it. We've, we've tried very hard to find the, uh, any hormone profile changes that would correlate with these, and we, we can't find any, especially that are consistent across experiment or are consistent across dose. To, to date, we have none. Yeah, Mark Miller with mm -hmm. the WEHA. Um, specifically following up on that, since uh, that would make me think that there are other signaling events not related to hormone or mm -hmm. connected to it, but you, that you wouldn't see in, in hormone levels as such. And um, since we know that branching morphogenesis is occurring in various other organs at the same time, have you thought to expand to look at, say, the lung, salivary gland, or yeah, the other yeah, things? That, it, right. Yeah. Um, actually, we haven't because there, because the same, so what I hypothesize is that it's signaling that's indigenous to the tissue itself that is critical here. Like, for example, we know that when we do transplant work, with the aerial hydrocarbon, the dioxin treated animals. We can remove the epithelium from one animal and put it into the fat pad of another, a cleared fat pad that doesn't have any epithelium anymore. We surgically remove it. We can put that in there and it is the stroma, the fat pad, that is critical in the response to dioxin. That's not the case for all of these. So the critical component in that dioxin response is in the stroma, not the epithelium, which is opposite of what you may think. Um, therefore, <laughs> we're, we're looking at possibly a different mechanism than we are for atrazine, because with the atrazine, we know we saw the changes in aromatase, as, as EGF receptor. EGF receptor is clearly um, epiderm, um, epithelial and stromal. Um, aromatase is stromal. So I think it's more what is in the mammary gland itself that's driving these responses instead of what external signals are driving them. And it may be that, it may be that because we're exposing these animals early that we have this fetal programming event going on where we're changing for the rest of their life the receptor profiles that are present in that tissue or we're changing their ability to respond to the signal. So those are some of the things that we're very interested in pursuing, especially as it pertains to um, a physiological response across multiple different exposures. So that's a good question. We have not, to answer your question, we have not pursued these other tissues, mostly because if our hypothesis is correct, we need to focus more than um, spread out. We have a question from Dr. Rajpal Tomer in our Oakland office. Given the, increased re given the increased reproductive senescence in SD rats, 
Irrespective of the cause or effects of hormonal changes, do you think it is an appropriate model to test endocrine disruption? Could re reproductive senescence be the reason for discordances in results between SD rats and Fisher rats for atrazine and genistein-induced breast cancer? Absolutely. Uh, we don't use Sprague Dolly rats for that exact reason. The lung evidence rats um, don't, aren't as sensitive to atrazine in this hastened reproductive senescence. And so we've shied away from the Sprague Dollies for that exact reason. We don't want that to play a role. We don't want that it to be a confounder in our studies. And yes, I do think that's probably a big difference in the Fisher versus Sprague Dollies. And I, I, know, I, I know NTP is really working on this. You know, NTPs traditionally use those strains of rats for everything they've done. And, and I know that they've changed now to the Wistar. And, um, and they're considering changing their mouse strain also because of these quirks, I guess, for no other better term. Hi, uh, Jennifer Xie from Ohiha. Uh, it is a very interesting talk, and you provide a lot of interesting data. Um, today, you are talking about uh, three chemical atrazine and dioxin, and those uh, category chemical uh, has the ability to uh, delay the terminal end bar uh, development and differentiation. Mm -hmm. But as we know, uh, the other group, the EC EDCs, has a, a totally opposite uh, ability, uh, such as DES and genistein can promote mm -hmm. uh, terminal end bar, end bar de mm -hmm. uh, development. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Curious, did you design a study, uh, use those mixture together, and put into the, your animal model to see what's, it, what's going to happen? Right. And right. Yeah. Um, I know that Coral La Martiniere's group at University of Alabama is doing some of that. At, he, he's done a lot of the genistein work, him and Retha Newbold's group, and they don't necessarily agree either on their effects. Part of, part of the problem with some of those compounds is that some are being injected instead of orally administered. And you do get different results based on how you expose the animal and when you expose the animal. Those, some of the bisphenol A work and genistein in particular are highly controversial or they're all fighting with each other right now because you know, obviously, oral administration is much more similar to what we would be exposed to, but it's easier to expose a neonatal animal by injecting it versus gavage. And so I'm not sure that that field even agrees with the outcomes on the mammary gland because of those differences, because of the differences in timing of exposure and the route of exposure and the fact that some of the studies do and some don't measure what the circulating levels of the uh, isoflavones are. Um, we, haven't, we haven't considered doing that because we have specific goals in mind of how we're going to kind of trudge ahead with this. But there are, there are groups that are considering doing that. I just don't know how close they are to getting and to the point yeah. where they can agree on, <laughs> on a study design. Yeah, I know it's a very complicated uh, question right now. So I, yeah, I'm just curious, what, what's your opinion about, because you know, the, in the environmental, everything is just mixture together. Yes, right, yeah. right. And you yeah. provide a wonderful another uh, alternative pathway a mechanism mm -hmm. for those mm -hmm. EDCs. Right. So I'm just curious, what's right. your opinion to those uh, well, complicated questions? Based on the, de the effects that we get from the early developmental exposure, you know, where we have these critical windows, we know that some compounds in your life or in your daily exposure may have more of an effect than others. Based on your stage of development or your um, specifically talking about, you know, a woman who is pregnant, if her, if her, if she happens to have a large exposure to PFOA, say, um, or if she, like the women in West Virginia, may well have, she may be more sensitive to that one exposure than she is to the, all of her, the rest of her day's exposure. And so I think because of that, 
it, it makes this even more complicated. So you're not just talking about what you're exposed to, uh, to today or, or this week, but what's going on in your body at that same time during this complex exposure. And so I, th I really think this critical period of exposure is really a big deal. I mean, it's something that, you know, I have a, I have a woman in my lab, a postdoc in my lab, who recently had a baby, and my learning curve was enormous while she was pregnant because she would keep bringing me papers all the time about, you know, how to avoid um, alternate, alternate soaps to use instead of the antimicrobial soaps or antibacterial soaps or she, you know, it's just women today who are, who are pregnant need to have a better awareness of all of these things and how they can avoid some of the exposures um, because it certainly isn't something we need in us. <laughs> so I don't know. I can't really answer your question, but I, I do feel like the critical period issue is a big deal when you're talking about the mixture expo exposures. I'm um, taking up half your day. To Sorry. Continue this discussion, but I think we have to go. Have a move on. And think about the issues and send your questions to me or to Dr. Fenton directly. We can continue this discussion. Thank you very much. And Thank you. mark your calendar. Come to our next one. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to continue the discussion, join us for the lunch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.